Good evening and welcome to Bruce Presents. This is the Bruce Museum's monthly program that highlights thought leaders in art and science. My name is Suzanne Leo. I'm Managing Director and Chief Operating Officer at the Bruce Museum. And I'm excited to welcome you all tonight uh, to The Art of the Extinct, a conversation with paleo artist Jason Brom and Gabriel Ungueto. Uh, these gentlemen have been bringing extinct species back to life for museum visitors and television viewers for years. And they are joining us tonight to share with us some of their stories and some of their secrets. So we're really excited about that. But before we begin, let me thank our sponsor. Tonight's program and all of the Bruce Presents programs uh, would not be possible without support from sponsor Berkeley One. And with us tonight is Christy from Berkeley One. Thank you so much, Christy. Thank you. Um, Berkeley One is a proud sponsor of the Bruce Presents lecture series and the entry around dinosaurs doesn't have an age limit from one to 100. We are all in awe of these creatures that came before us. And I think we can all agree that we are thrilled we didn't have to worry about bumping into a T-Rex on our way to work. Um, at Berkeley One, we provide personal insurance solutions for individuals and families that's unique to them. Um, similar to a scientific illustrator, we use scientific data and research to customize insurance coverage and solutions for our clients and our team of an incredible underwriters are committed to designing the coverage that is needed to keep them moving forward. I couldn't be more excited to hear from Jason and Gabriel on their methods and process that they use to create these indescribable creatures. So let's hear it. Thank you so much. Thank you to Berkeley One for sponsoring this really special evening. Uh, tonight's program to the participants, it's going to enable you to engage with our speakers and with this event through the chat function and the Q&A. So you can enter any sort of comments or questions that you have, and we will get to them at the end of our conversation here. Um, I invite you to include any questions that you have into these forums, and again, we'll address them at the end of the night. So welcome to our panelists. Jason, tell us a little bit about yourself. Uh, well, I I came to New York in 1997, and the second job I applied for was at the American Museum of Natural History, and uh, I got it. And um, I, I at that time I was a painter of um, fine art, like oil paintings of like uh, human figures, semi-abstracted uh, paintings, and um, and but I also had a background where I'd done a lot of coursework in biology. And I was very interested in anatomy and paleontology. And so I got this job and gradually uh, I, found, I found it more and more fulfilling uh, to, to, to keep working in, in, in a way that combines art and science rather than in just the fine art. And um, so what basically happened is like, I took this as a day job and it actually replaced my love of my life, which was, uh, you know, which was like more of a fine art type of a thing before. But so I guess now I've been doing it for about 23 years. Wow. And, and I've, I've got, in addition to work at the museum, I also have a, a side, uh, you know, company doing it for myself and for a variety of other clients around the world. And uh, it's, it's, it's been a great time to do it too, because it's, I just happen to luck out and start doing it right at the time when a lot of the biggest discoveries are coming out of China and with a team, with teams that were interpreting these these fossils and really showing amazing new stuff, and um, and so it's been it's been uh, I've been very extremely lucky in in well, at least two ways. That is awesome, um, and we know you for other reasons. We at the Bruce Museum know you for other reasons, and we'll get to that in a moment. But Gabriel, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself? Well, um, I'm originally from Venezuela, and I moved to the U.S. about 23 years ago. And um, I, I, I'm originally a traditional artist. Uh, I studied graphic design and illustration. And then I also uh, worked for many years as an independent uh, researcher in herpetology. And I started doing a lot of scientific art and wildlife art. And um, I think that naturally progressed uh, into paleo art because I always say that there are two avenues to go, usually to go in scientific illustration. You either go to 
paleo art or you go to you know medical illustration and i'm a germaphobe and a little bit of a hypochondriac so i would never have gone into medical illustration so i definitely went into into paleo art and i love animals i've always loved animals since i have you know since i can remember and uh because my work as a herpetologist just one thing led to the other so i work I, i'm uh, originally a traditional artist, but about, I would say 10 years ago, I started working digitally. And nowadays I work primarily digitally. I still do some traditional work, especially sketches and stuff like that. Sometimes I, I work uh, doing that, but my work focus mostly on uh, digital art, just because it's easier, it's faster, um, turnaround times is, are, are faster. And when you're working with clients, it's, it's you know, that's what they want. They want somebody that can work fast and they can turn around the good work quickly. So especially with the time frames that you have in, in, in scientific illustrations that can be very short sometimes. So um, yeah, so I'm, I'm a freelance artist and I've worked uh, for uh, many scientific publications and museums. And um, I've also done concept art for um, documentaries, for TV documentaries. And um, I've done several illustrations for several books. Awesome, that's amazing. And you're doing an exciting project, but we'll get to that in a moment too. So I think I wanna start with Jason. Um, I put together kind of like a, a little slideshow of some of the stuff that you've been working on. And I thought maybe we could talk about, um, you know, you told us a little bit about how you got into this, but maybe you could share with us sort of what we're looking at for some of these, um, for some of these images. Oh, hold on one second. Live theater, everyone. It's live theater. Here we go. So why don't you tell us a little bit about what we're looking at and um, and specifically you do a lot of sculpting. How do you transfer something from a 2D to a 3D? Oh, that's a good question. Um, yeah, I, I started, I, I, uh, I think that I'm better at sculpting than I am at 2D art. Um, sculpture came more naturally to me. My father was a sculptor. And it was a, I don't know, like when I when I did figure sculpting in, in art school, um, it, it I, I think I was more talented at that. Um, but then I pursued painting and drawing as the things that I really wanted to do. Partly, I think because it was more challenging for me. Like when I look at Gabriel's work, I can tell he's a super talented illustrator. Like he, he does extremely realistic surfaces and light and stuff like that. It doesn't, it, it's, that comes pretty hard for me. I, I like him, I also use uh, Photoshop now because everybody wants full color stuff and you wanna be able to change the elements around, but that takes me forever. I just keep redoing it and redoing it and redoing it for months, I can do it for years. But the, um, but so what I was saying before is like for, for me, sculpture, like actually doing 3D clay models, things like this, which is- a, Here, let me, let me stop sharing so we can see. So who is that? Who are you holding there? This is, this is the head of a DeLong, which is a, it was discovered in China. It's a, um, a primitive Tyrannosaurid, a relative of Tyrannosaurus rex. And of course it's just the head. But, you know, I, I, I do a ton of stuff like that. And um, uh, I don't know, I just think that that comes a lot more easily for me. And so one of the things I do a lot is I make 3D maquettes, actually, I guess you could say practical effects, I actually sculpt them in clay uh, with little metal armatures, things like that. And using that, you can get like the fall of the shadows and the light on it. You can get some sense of it, you know, sort of three-dimensionally. So when you start working in, if, you, if you're representing it in two dimensions, you can get some of the specifics that you observe in the mod, in the small size model or maquette. And you can be more confident that, it, that it's a realistic like uh, shadow that falls underneath it or, or the way that the light uh, moves across the, the side, but that sort of thing. If it's observed, I'm more confident than if I'm just sort of making it up as I go. Interesting. I wanna go back to the, the screen share for a minute because, and I wanna try and do it without breaking my computer, like wish me luck. Let's see, oh good, here we go. Um, this because, one. I think you started telling me a little bit about, about this, this project, which I think yeah. sort of builds on what you were just saying. Can you tell us a little bit about this? 
Yeah, this was from a, a project with a Nova, with the GBH, um, you know, a Nova series. Uh, that series, I think, started when I was a little kid. I think it started when I was like five years old or something like that. Uh, you know, uh, and it's still going to this day. But so this was for one episode, I think it was called The Four-Winged Dinosaur. And this is Microraptor. And for that project, I was brought on, it was sort of like a reality show format. And I was brought on as the anatomical sculptor to do to build an act like an actual model that you can hold in your hands, not a computer model, of the entire skeleton of Microraptor, and then the whole musculature, and then this was the basis of a model that we put in a wind tunnel uh, to see if we could get if we could figure out if this thing could glide or fly or not. And so what you're seeing here is an image of the clay and plastic model that I built which we then shipped to the Royal Veterinary College in, in England. And uh, John, Dr. John Hutchinson there did a CT scan of it. And he used that to, to, uh, to, for a mathematical model, aerodynamic model to see like where the center of mass would be, where the center of drag would be, if, if it were an aerodynamic animal. Wow. So that's sort of an incredible, that's, to me, I think that's sort of an incredible um, example of how your work informed science. I feel like I went into this thinking that almost exclusively it was the science that's informing the art, but in that case, they went the other way around. Uh, well, yes, uh, there, there can be some feedback. I think it's, it's, it's limited because how much the art informs the science because the PhDs, the, paleo the paleontologists, they have to publish papers and they have to go through a very rigorous process to put anything in a paper. Um, because it, it all can be, it all should be critiqued by the scientific community and by the peer reviewers of the papers. And so they have to be really, really rigorous. And the art is more often used to, um, to very quickly get the message across of sort of what we discovered or what potentially we could be looking at and to get a wider audience interested in it. Um, there might be some examples where um, like really great works of art have, have, um, have made the, the, the PhDs think along different lines maybe, but, but for the most part, I mean, in that case, the only way that we could, you can, you can do a purely mathematical computer simulation of the animal, but the producers wanted to see if, if building a 3D model, uh, a real plastic one that we can actually put in a wind tunnel would teach us anything we didn't know that we hadn't found out from the other sources. I love that. I think that's incredible. I think that's just incredible. Um, so tell us about this little guy. Well, that's the head I showed you earlier. That was a piece for American Museum of Natural History, which uh, this is this animal's called Dilong. It's uh, it's the same as the head I showed you just now. It was it was discovered in China and it preserved fairly long feathers in one specimen of the fossil, you could see that there were keratinous uh, filaments on either side of the bones. And this showed not only that it um, had, you know, some feathery or proto feather type covering, but that they were fairly long, longer than we might have thought. We might have thought that early in the evolution of feathers that they would be, you know, pretty, pretty small or sort of like filamentous scales, but they were already pretty big. And when you have an animal that has long filaments, it really changes the way it looks. It changes its whole contour. And if there's different lengths of, of filaments across the body, it can totally change the proportions of the body. You can think of like, if you can see, a, if, you, if you can think of a barn owl, it has a head that's almost like a basketball, like a, like a sphere. But if you pluck it, it looks like a vulture. Hmm. All, of, all of that shape to its head is actually uh, just feathers. That, that hold that shape. And, and, if you, and inside it's actually very skinny and very pointed beaked animal. So the, once the feathers come into the picture, uh, the animal looks completely different. The last thing I'll say about this DeLong is that it's nice that it's one that I got to reconstruct twice for the museum. We did it once in 2003 and we did it again uh, just a few years ago, I think in 2018. Um, and it's nice to be able to get to do one twice because you can, all the mistakes I made that have been bothering me for years and years, I got the chance to go back and, and fix them. That is, we should all be so lucky. <laughs> <laughs>
So um, some of our viewers might remember or recognize this friend. I'm going to put a better spin on it. Here he is at the Bruce Museum. Why don't you tell us about this charismatic little guy? He looks really different in different lights. Um, yeah. you, know, you, have, you have to get a good photographer to get him to look his best. Um, this is the state fossil of Connecticut is Eubrontes, which is an ichnofossil, which is a fossilized footprint. It's a, a three-toed footprint, just like you'd see from a giant bird or something like that. Um, and we don't know exactly what made that track, but um, it fits quite closely to an animal that's known from west of North America at that time called Dilophosaurus. So your cura curator, Dr. Dan Sepka, had me make a model pretty much of Dilophosaurus um, to represent the Eubrontes making animal. And um, it just so happened that he had reviewed a paper by Adam Marsh, who had done a really thorough study of uh, uh, osteology of all the study of all the known fossil bones of Dilophosaurus. And so your model that you have at the Bruce uh, was the most up to date one. Uh, I feel confident in saying that 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 was out there at, the, at that time. By now, people have caught up, I'm sure. But Dan gave, Dan gave me access to this monograph on Dilophosaurus before it was even published. So it was, um, it was like the, the most cutting edge stuff. And it was great animal to reconstruct. I'd always found it fascinating because it's, its name means like two crested lizard because it has these two giant crests down the, down the top of its head, which had, you know, almost everyone who looks at it is pretty confident it had to be for display. So that means it might've been colorful and it might have been used to signal to other members of its own species or even as threat, war you know, warning colors to, to, to predators, things like that. Uh, I mean, it's just incredible. I think most people who come to the museum are really surprised to see um, its color. And we'll come back to that concept in a little bit. But I'm going to turn it over now to Gabriel. Gabriel, why don't you share with us a little bit about what you've been working on and um and tell us a little bit about your process because you are working in a largely a different medium you're doing a lot more with 2d art tell us a little bit about it well i can show you a little bit uh, let me share my screen so are you seeing my screen right now yes okay so um this is a piece i did a few years ago, I think, yeah, I think this is pre-pandemic. That's how I see time now, pre-pandemic and post-pandemic. Everything that came before and everything that <laughs> yeah. will come after, yes. I think we all are now, yeah. Yes, this is a, a new species of, of, of um, troodontid dinosaur that was, this, that was uh, described a few years ago and um, from the US and it's called Hesperonitoides. And it is, it is, uh, closely, troodontids are closely related to what the general audience would call raptors, like velociraptors and stuff like that. And they are also closely related to uh, birds. It's a, it's, a, it's a close lineage. So we can be, you know, more or less sure that they were covering feathers, like I'm portraying them here. In, in, even with penaceous feathers in the, in the, what you would call the wing. Um, so I want to share with you more or less how I normally go about my process. And um, for that, I, I, this is how I usually start. When I am asked to reconstruct a, 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 a species, whatever species it is, and, and I'm not just talking about dinosaurs, or it could be any other kind of um, extinct animals, because I think sometimes the, people have the wrong impression that we paleo artists only reconstruct dinosaurs, that we don't. We actually reconstruct all kinds of extinct animals, you know, whether they're mammals or sometimes arthropods and, and um, you know, even, even plants, although that's a, that's a little bit outside of my realm and, and plants can be really a pain to reconstruct because it's just very, diff, very few things are known sometimes from plants, uh, from extinct plants. So I try to stay away from it until, unless I, don't have any other choice. But what I usually start before when I when I uh, I'm going to reconstruct an animal, I first start and and uh, people don't know this, but a big part of paleo artists is to read and to research. 
I spent a lot of time reading papers and trying to, you know, like what Jason said about reading the monograph of the Dilophosaurus and, you know, learning all he could about the morphology and uh, of that animal. You have to do a lot of that. And um, I try to stay on top of all the recent research, all the recent hypotheses, uh, because paleo art is a constant changing, you know, science because we have new discoveries coming up all the time. So um, I first started doing that and I tried to learn what the taxonomy of this animal is, meaning that what is it most closely related to? Because that is gonna inform me about some details that might be missing on fossils. Most fossils are incomplete. Like we might have a little bit of a, of a skull, a little bit of a of the leg, and we have to know what that animal was more closely related to to speculate on what the rest of the body looked like. There are actually few fossils that are completely known. Like you have animals probably like Tyrannosaurus rex, which is which which is known from several fossils. And then yeah, we on that one we have a very good idea of what it looked like completely. But there are a lot of other species that we don't know what they look like and and we have to get an idea based on what they are related to so that's my first uh that's the first thing i do then i, I try to find information about what the climate was what that animal lived and uh what type of habitat it lived in like for example in this species that i have here this is from the morrison formation and in that part of the formation we know more or less that it was a semi-arid uh, uh, open forest. And we know more or less the species of um, vegetation and plants that, was, that were present in the area. So for me, that is very important because that's going to inform me on what kind of external integument, that means what kind, if the animal had a lot of feathers or few feathers, if it was hot, then it probably needed to not be completely covered in feathers because it would overheat. And it would also be very important for me in terms of thinking about coloration and, and how I want to depict it in its environment. Um, because it, that, will inf that, that will be extremely important uh, when you have to think of all those details. Then after that, I do my first sketch of what I think the animal look, and, and I can show you a little bit what those first sketches look like. Um, give me one second. Let me see if I can pull this in here. Uh, let's see this over here and see if I can pull one sketch. Uh, 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 let me see. What Gabriel said about um about the plants being a pain yeah. is absolutely true. The, the, the fact is that most fossil plants are known from individual leaves or seeds or uh, uh, more rarely stems. And there's in paleobotany, it's not um, considered uh, uh, defensible to just sort of put stems and leaves and, and, and seeds together. So there are a lot, of, a lot of species, like we know from the Morrison formation that we know from the leaves but it, you could, it could be a low plant, like a shrub, or it could be a tall tree. And that's, and if whichever one you do is completely hypothetical. Mm. So, so here he's shown some cycads and, and, and probably benetites, which are notoriously hard to reconstruct because no one knows if they're tall trees or, or bushes or, or both. Exactly. Incredible. Um, yes, I am. <laughs> I'm trying to find this sketch I want to show you. For some reason, I cannot find it right now. If you give me one second, I will try to find it. You know what, Gabriel, if you stop sharing, I have a couple other works from Jason that I can show sure. while, while you're yeah. looking. So um, let's see here. I know I'm going to find it immediately when you start doing oh, that. Well, naturally, it's Murphy's Law. So Jason, I, I mistakenly thought this was just your average run-of-the-mill bird that was somewhere in the in the backyard somewhere, but you're saying this is something much different and this is representative of, of an extinct species. Yeah, this is this animal is called Liao Shiornis. It's from a group of extinct of birds that's completely extinct. They used to be more diverse, the, the most diverse group of primitive birds 
called enantiornithines. Um, now there are no living representatives from that group. They, the, it was an entire evolutionary dead end, but they have everything from like predatory raptor birds to uh, water birds to these small perching birds that lived in forests like, like Laos Shiornis here. And many of them, not all, but most, still had little tiny teeth. So in, in this image, there's little tiny teeth in that. It's not a beak, it's like a little dinosaur uh, nose, so it's snout. And this is a piece I did many years ago using some photo compositing and some painting, which I'd be interested to hear if Gabriel uses photo, photo comp compositing also. Um, I'm trying to get more away from that because uh, it just, I'm not sure I ever got it to mesh very well with like the painted parts and the photo parts um, going together. It's, I just feel like it, it feels better to me when, when I do the whole thing of painting. Uh, by, way, by painting, I mean, of course, just pixels, just right on Photoshop without, without uh, copying any photos. But this, this, these enantiornithines also had, they were also primitive in another way, which is that most of them retained these sorts of, um, if you can see that. Yeah, I mean, I, that's incredible. What am I looking at? This is, uh, this is not Liao Shiornis. It's another enantiornithine bird, I'm pretty sure, that was found preserved in Burmese amber from the early Cretaceous. It's an incredibly tiny little specimen, but they put it in a synchrotron, uh, which makes very high energy x-rays. And this is a, basically a, a CT scan of what they found. And so this is the tip of the wing of an enantiornithine bird. Each of these lines here is the quill of one <coughs> of the flight feathers. And they all implant in the hand of the bird, which still had these, oops, you're pointing the wrong way, which, which still had these little claws on the end. So it still had little, you know, independently movable fingers. That's too close to the screen there, with little claws on the end, even though it also had wing feathers. Uh, so it was like a wing with little claws in it. And that's not, that's strange by today's standards, but actually there are still birds today, especially young birds that will retain claws on the inside of their wings, like even baby geese and ducks will sometimes have a little sharp claw on the inside of, the, of their wing when they're still covered in down. Yeah, people should uh, Google uh, an image of an ostrich hand with no, with an ostrich wing with no feathers and you'll see how, which huge claws it has. It has like huge, huge claws. Really? Yep. Really? There's another famous bird called a Watson, which is from, I think, Ecuador, which especially the juveniles, they, they don't get wing feathers right away. They, get, uh, they have pretty large and independently movable claws. And so they use those to scramble around in the, in the uh, trees where they're, where they're born, but they, they leave the nest early and just scramble around from branch to branch. And it's just fascinating. One of the one of the questions I have that um, and Gabriel, I don't know if you have found your sketch yet. Yeah, I did. <laughs> you did. Yes. Um, and maybe you can answer this while we're looking. You know, one of the things you guys brought up, both of you, was color. And I'm curious, yes. how do we know what color a feather was, or how do we know what color or or tone what a, a a scale or skin is, how is that? Is that artistic license? Is that scientifically driven? How do we know? Both. Um, well, I was about to get to that point. Uh, let me just share my screen again. Sure. OK, so um, I start doing sketches like this. This is the first part of the of, of the um, of the sketching process, and these are these are actually not dinosaurs. These are early synapsids. These are related to us. Mammals. These oh, are okay. These are not mammals. Animals. Mammals, yeah. Yes, and and so I I first started doing this, and then I moved to other kind of sketches. These are um, Cenozoic mammals, to um, extinct mammals. That and I start thinking about you know different positions and different. And this is when I start looking at coloration. And when you talk about coloration, that's that's very important because nowadays for some species we have uh, an idea of what color and pattern they could have had. That's fairly recent in the last 10 years or so. And um, that we know that back because some, um, when, when there are some filaments preserved, fossilized, um, also the, the structures that are responsible for some color 
uh, are also fossilized on the microscopic level. And, and those, those um, uh, structures are called um, melanosomes. And melanosomes are the organelles that are responsible for producing, for absorbing the light, for producing the color. Some colors, there are colors like blue and green that are structural and you know, green not always, but blue is always structural. So that means that it's produced by the way, by, by a structure, meaning it's not produced by an organelle. It's not produced by something absorbing light, but it's produced by, an, by a structure, not an actual, there's not uh, an organelle that produces the color. So we cannot tell if something is blue, for example. But we, by, by looking at the melanosomes and their shape, because each color has a different shape of melanosome, we can determine if the animal had brown, reddish, uh, gray, black, or white tones. And, and it also informs us uh, of the pattern that they could have had. So there are examples uh, like um, like the, the dinosaur, um, uh, I'm blanking out on the name. Um, well, there are several, like Anchiornis, for example, is a, is a, is a dinosaur that is, that is no, known from several specimens and we know very well of what coloration he had because, um, or the pattern, because, because he has been thoroughly studied. So we know that the animal was mostly grayish with uh, a uh, the wing pattern was white and uh, white feathers with black tips. And then he had like a reddish brown area on the head. So we have a good idea. Now that is only known for a small portion of the fossils. For most other things you have to do what I told, what I was talking about earlier. We have to think about the environment. We have to think about what is related to. We have to think about the probable habitat they lived in the climate, the habits, the, the, the hypothesized habits that it had, how it behaved, because that's gonna inform also. And then also another thing that I like to do is that I like to look at patterns that repeat in certain groups of animals. Like um, uh, there are coloration patterns that, that tend to repeat in certain groups of animals. Like in reptiles, and that include, includes birds, for example, um, um, they, they are very visual animals. They have very good eyesight, both you know, lizards and, and birds, they all have very good eyesight. So for them, coloration is very important, usually for signaling and display. And uh, I've noticed that a lot of birds and a lot of lizards and a lot of other reptiles tend to have concentrated areas of coloration around the eye, either the eye itself or areas around the eye. So I know that if I'm doing a, a reconstruction and I pay especially close attention to that area, chances are that I'm going to be doing something that was probably likely to occur in, in extinct animals. So that for me is one of the, I, I'm sure that Jason does the same. I mean, you, you probably look also a lot of like extant animals and, and what kind of patterns they have and, and draw attention for me. I, I, what I, where I draw the line is that I think it's very bad to, uh, imitate exactly a, the pattern of a, of a living animal into an extinct one, I, that's a no for me. So I okay. stay away from that. <laughs> I'm gonna go back to the screen, okay. So. I know, it, I know what Gabriel means with that. Uh, like there are some animals that are extant, uh, you know, that are, that are alive today that have really cool patterns. Like, like maybe, uh, I don't know, there are types of like um, opossums and things like that, that that'll have a particular pattern and you'll, you'll look at all the different patterns that, that might be possible for primitive mammals. And you'll think, well, this one looks really cool and you'll wanna put it on a, uh, an extinct uh, species. But then uh, you, it's, it's sort of like, you know, it, it's just too specific to that species. And then you're like projecting it back and it looks cool, but it, it almost certainly isn't true. I, I, wanted to add that, uh, I wanted to add to what Gabriel said about, um, about uh, structural color. Um, in my own case, I got to do a reconstruction. You showed earlier uh, one of the model, models I built of Microraptor a few years ago, but I've also reconstructed Microraptor three times for, the, for my museum. And, um, and the first time we, we, knew it had, we knew it had feathers, we knew it had aerodynamic like uh, asymmetrical flight feathers and wings, not only on its arms, but also on its legs. But as far as color, we just had to guess. And so, in natural history, there are sort of rules of thumb that like, 
animals in maybe grasslands, they tend to have sort of a tan type color, a uh, little lighter on the belly maybe for counter shading. Um, and, and animals in temperate areas tend to be less colorful than those in tropical areas. Some just basic rules of thumb like that. So the first time we did Microraptor, we just did it as kind of brown with a with dark and light patterning. But then as we kept going, the years went by and uh, those melanosomes that Gabriel was talking about were found in the feathers of some specimens of, my, of new fossil specimens of Microraptor that had just been discovered. And then they were uh, examined under, you know, extremely expensive uh, microscope analysis. And, and it turned out that the, it looked like they were, most of the feathers were black, like those of a crow or a grackle. But in addition, they had some of the structural color that Gabriel mentioned where uh, chemical color is where light hits a pigment and all of the wavelengths are absorbed except for one, let's say red is bounced back. So that pigment will be very bright red to our eye because the red colored photons are reaching our eye. There's another type that Gabriel mentioned structural, which is also called iridescence, which is where the, the microscopic ridges on the feather, the shape of the feather refract the light back to your eye and, on, and only the wavelengths that are blue will reach your eye because those are the only ones that are refracted. And so it turned out Microraptor had just a little touch of that, not like bright blue, like a blue jay, but with a little touch of blue on top of the black, like a grackle, or there are a lot of other birds that have, have a similar kind of sheen to them. And so like yeah. the third time, I think we reconstructed Microraptor, I did it black with, with a metallic sheen on the feathers. And that was one where the first time uh, I used the uh, artist's rules of thumb to try to come up with a, a plausible pattern. The third time we had much more information and it was, it was interesting to see the change. Yeah, and to, and, to, and to continue what Jason is saying, that uh, iridescence has been now found in a lot of dinosaurs. I did a reconstruction for National Geographic a couple of years ago. Let me share it here. This is Kai Hong. It's it's uh, um, it, it's no it's no from a from a fossil that preserves a lot of feathers and the feathers are known to have this a similar um, uh, iridescence quality to some birds that are you know, called trumpeteers in South America and they have their the feather it's like it's like a hummingbird when you look at hummingbird it it can look black on certain light but under certain light conditions because it's a structural color, it can be very iridescent. So it's, it's believed, we know now more or less, we, we don't know what color the iridescence can be, but we know that it's iridescent. And we know that there are, there are different areas of iridescence, so we can tell that certain areas must have been colored differently. So what I tried to show here was that the animal probably had different areas of coloration, iridescence in different areas. We know that it was iridescent, we don't know exactly what tone of iridescence it could have had. It could have been, you know, uh, we know that it changed the tone or, or color of iridescence, but we don't know exactly what, what tone of iridescence it had. I mean, so you went for kind of a rainbow if, there, it looks like. Yeah, yes. I was gonna say, even if that's the best, I mean, it's gorgeous. If not, that's the best guess, that's really cool. Um, you both work from, from several sources, it sounds like. Uh, you read a lot, you do a lot of papers. I assume you know you've both you've both spoken about um, using fossils, but getting back to that paper idea, I feel like um, there is a greater incidence of of more and more people wanting to make an academic statement, wanting to find that discovery, wanting to have that thing. How do you do you choose? Do you have a choice of what papers? you use to help inform your work or is that something that's largely chosen for you how do you know that what you have is like you know peer-reviewed it is cutting-edge science it's 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 largely been validated by the community um how do you make sure that what you're putting out into the public is the latest and the greatest you want to go first jason <laughs> yeah sometimes you're, you're working for the people who did the, who wrote the paper and uh, they didn't know they were going to get it published and they just got word that it's going to be published and they they call you and they say can you do an illustration they send you the preprint of the paper and 
a lot of times your eyes pop out because they found something really amazing and you you get really excited to 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 work on it with them it's it's collab it's collaboration partly because uh, most of these papers now come out with like you know four to 25 really good authors and they're, they're all in slightly different sub disciplines and they're all they're they're all um uh they're all bringing their own discipline to it, but then it also has to go through peer review. And then uh, people in the peer review process can say uh, they made a mistake or they, they are overinterpreting the evidence they have. Um, and then when it gets published, that's when it just, that's when the debate just really starts. But um, there are some pitfalls, I guess, like there are some things you can find online that look cool that, that uh, people who uh, put up images of, of reconstructions of extinct animals that that you might want to believe in, but then you find out that they they haven't gone through the peer review process, and um, and I think the community of good um, paleo artists out there, they're sticklers. Like I know Gabriel's one, and and there's a lot of other people out there. Like uh, they're hard to fool. If you've read a lot of these papers, you you know you can pretty readily figure out which ones are rigorously tested and which ones are kind of just speculative. Um, but, but Gabriel, you, you should go now. Um, I think I come, I come to this with a, a more of a scientific perspective on my, because I'm a published author of scientific papers. So I went, I have been through the peer review system and I've been through all that. And I, so I know what it is, but, but I, I, uh, I, I, in my position, because I like it, I read everything. And, um, and, this, and, and in science, it's just, we cannot say that anything is 100% the truth, especially in a subject like paleontology, where we have a lot of unknowns. So what we have is a collection of hypotheses. And what I do, if I am not working for somebody and I'm, and I'm, and I'm trying to bring life to his or her hypothesis, to their hypothesis, what I try to do is, based on my knowledge, I try to say, "Oh, this hypo hypothesis to me sounds that it has a it's, it has better grounds than other hypotheses." So I'm going to go with this hypothesis for my reconstruction. If I'm working for somebody else and I agree with what they're saying, because um, I also have been approached sometimes to try to do reconstruction some stuff that I don't find is uh, uh, sound. <laughs> so I, I, no, I don't do that because I think you, you do have a reputation as a paleo artist, you know, that, that the, uh, you want to portray something that is, has been peer reviewed, that is, that is, that is, you know, have gone through a process where it's been peer reviewed and, and well studied and it has based on good data. Um, uh, so yeah, I think for me, I come from, from that, but I, I sincerely, I look at everything. I am always trying to find, I'm always up uh, trying to see what's new in the old paper because it's not because I have to read it, it's because I'm really interested in it, you know? So, you know, I, and I think it's interesting too, when it, we, we've been talking about all these things and we talk about paleo artists and we talk to some about dinosaurs and birds and mammals, do paleo artists specialize? So do you, I mean, like for instance, no one showed me, the, I, I haven't seen any examples of underwater. Is there a paleo mm. artist that specializes in underwater species, for example, or, 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 or again, you mentioned that paleobotanists, they have a hard time. Is there a, a, a specialty that works with paleobotany? And how do you work with them to produce some of the work that you guys do? There are paleobotanists, and uh, and uh, and uh, and there are paleo artists that are particularly good at paleobotany, and no, I'm not one of those. Uh, but uh, but but yeah, but paleo artists do, you know, whether you like it or not, there are some things in which you're going to be better than in others. And I, for example, I I have done a bit of everything. I did, I've I've done even plant reconstructions for the Burke, for the Burke Museum. And I've done, uh, um, and I've done many arthropods, but particularly I prefer to stay with um, tetrapods. So vertebrates, vertebrates, tetrapods. 
uh, because that's where I feel more comfortable and I think I know more about them. And I, so I don't, you know, sometimes when you when you are asked to reconstruct, like I had to do a book um, about hallucigenia, which is a very weird looking worm-like creature from the Cambrian, which is a long time ago when, when complex life basically started. And, and I knew about how Pabinia, but I had to reconstruct the whole environment and a lot of animals around it in, uh, about hallucigenia sort. And in that process, I had to do more reading that I've done in a long time because I wasn't so informed with it. So it's easier and I feel more comfortable going into tetrapods, for example, um, so I tend to stay around that, you know, I tend to stay in that, in that area. I'm sure Jason, you probably also. For my, for my own work, I haven't done as many um, invertebrates, although I would love to. Um, I, for my museum work, I have done a lot of invertebrates and mostly all um, extant ones. So ones that are not fossils. Um, so like I've done mantids and I've, I've even done um, diatoms and, um, and, that is great because like getting a little bit out of your comfort zone can and uh, and learning kind of the language of the anatomy of different types of organisms can really be, I think, good for your brain, you know, and like and shake you out of your uh, out of your thing. But most of my freelance stuff has been I did it. It's been mostly dinosaurs and birds, but I've done um, which, by the way, are the same thing. But but uh, but I, I did a, a primate once an extinct a, a two species of primates, I think, once. And I was grateful to have that opportunity. But I've always wanted to do like a Eurypterid or I, I've never done the, the Burgess Shale type Cambrian stuff that I would love to give that a shot too. I don't do very much underwater stuff, but I would like to try someday. It was awesome. I mean, I, I love doing that, but you, because I wasn't so familiar with it, I had to read a lot. I can show you some examples. Um, let me share my screen again. Yeah, go, I'm gonna go turn a light on. Okay. Um, Okay, so here is one that I did for a book also. This is a um, endoceras, which is a very big cephalopod. So it's related to like squids and, and, and these small things that are swimming around are trilobites that are, are a species of trilobite that swim, swam upside down. And I'm speculating here, or we decided to go in this book with a speculation that they had, um, uh, that they were bioluminescent. This is a bioluminescence scene. So they basically we're showing these animals both showing bioluminescence. And in this other case, there is this weird, weird, weird animal. This is also for that book of Hallucigenia called, this animal is called Opabinia and it looks like an alien creature because he has all those eyes and then like a trunk with some sort of forceps like uh, uh, claw at the, at, the, at the front. And then this, spiky worm thing is hallucigenia, the one that I was talking about. So this is one of the illustrations that I did for that book. I had to read a lot and I had to actually get, you know, to learn about the morphology. For example, I didn't know much about the, the, the morphology of uh, Opabinia, this creature, and what it was related to. So a lot of that took a long time for me to get familiar with, you know, how the, how the body was segmented, how, what kind of tissue it could have been, if it was hard, if it was soft, all those things. And uh, that, that was an amazing experience, but it was one of the times that I had to do the most research because I you know, wasn't so familiar with it. Um, Gabriel, I know at one point you wanted to actually show our audience sort of how you start a sketch and the, the kind of medium that you use because I don't, you don't work with pen and paper, right? I do sometimes, I have- Oh, you do, okay. Yeah, I do sometimes, I do some sketching on paper, and, and, but mostly, yes, I, I start, um, let me share my screen again. Okay, so mostly I start, uh, I'm gonna start like, I, I usually start with like a rough sketch. So let's say that we want to do um, Velociraptor, for example. So Velociraptor has a typical, Skull shape, and if I'm going to think about, uh, you know, if I'm rough sketching or getting ideas for a possible illustration, this is mostly how I start working. I start doing like lines of what I think the animal in what position I'm going to put it in, put it, the animal in. 
Already that eye is making me think of the Velociraptor from Jurassic Park. <laughs> okay, let me see. And then, um, so I start thinking about, okay, what, what I want this animal to look like. Uh, Velociraptor comes easy for me because I've done many and this is something I feel comfortable uh, doing because, you know, it's, uh, it's, a, it's a, one of those dinosaurs that you get to reconstruct over and over and over because you get asked to do over and over and over. So I will do a, a rough sketch like this at first. And then after that, I will probably go get a, a, a skeletal reconstruction. There are some artists that, there's some paleo artists that specialize in doing skeletal reconstructions. And that means that they do like a very good um, proportioned reconstruction of the skeleton. And that I, I use that usually to double check if, if there is not one available, I have to make my own. But I usually do that to make sure that my proportions are correct. Like, you know, like my head is proportion corrected to the neck proportion, to the leg proportions and all the things. Um, because that's very important. And trust me, people would notice if you're using the wrong proportions in your animal. Well, and also I assume, and Jason, you want to speak to this a little bit, that fossil record probably helps figure out proportions, even if it's just footprints, right? That would help figure out how long a stride was, for instance. Yeah, from footprints, you can, I, I'm not an expert on the footprint stuff, but from it, you can figure out the relative lengths of each of the segments of the, of the toes. Um, you know, the number of toes is very important to what, what type of animal it was. And then the, the individual lengths of the bones and, um, yeah, like in the case of dromaeosaurs, they have the, the, the second toe on the, on the medial side, as you can see, Gabriel drawing is, um, is, uh, elevated. It's held up. It has a, it has a sickle claw on it. And, um, and we have found tracks now that we think are from dromaeosaurs like that, that, that show the, show the the second toe being held up like that. Um, but from, yeah, from the bones, I mean, that's a thing that uh, is kind of, um, how would you put it, like a two-edged sword, because you definitely have to start with the skeletal proportions that are absolutely correct. And usually you have fossils that are complete enough that you can know that, or where you're missing parts, you can fill it in with closely related species. But then there's also the thing of where, if you're doing a complete life reconstruction, like. Gabriel's doing now, you have to go a little bit beyond that too, because once you put all those feathers on, um, if you can still see bones through it, you did something wrong. Exactly. Because like, like a sparrow, you, you, I mean, you can see the bones in its feet and you can see the bones in its feet maybe, but everywhere else it's a fluff ball. And, and, and it's not an undifferentiated fluff ball. It has a lot of complex little planes and barbs and barbules and feathers. And getting all of that surface right is is like a whole different thing from the bones underneath. Yeah, so uh, I, that is very important because I think that's one of the difference between old paleo art and modern paleo art. There is a lot of um, paleo art used to be very what we call sh shrink wrapped, meaning that uh, you know everything looked like it was attached to the bone, so you, there was no room for um, muscle and fat deposits and stuff, which are present in, in living animals. And you have to make do for that on top of the integument that goes on top of that, like whether it's um, in case of dinosaurs, feathers or fur in mammals, or, you know, that will even augment more the volume. So um, you have to take that in, a lot into consideration. Like for example, in this Velociraptor, the, the bone of the neck will probably be about this size. Mm. So I'm taking here, you know, I'm taking here musculature and feathers on top of that. Right. And by the <laughs> way, this, this Velociraptor that he's drawing, uh, the, the feathers are not known uh, in Velociraptor, if I'm, if I'm not mistaken, but we can infer them for two reasons. One is that uh, it is a dromaeosaur, so it's in the same family as like Microraptor, and Microraptor was completely covered in, in wing feathers. Um, and two, Velociraptor specimen was found that had uh, what are called quill knobs on the ulna, which is this bone here, and the follicles that hold wing feathers attach in a, in a row and leave a little scar where the ligaments attach. Like those, what I'm showing right now here. There you go, yeah, and those, those, those have been found on actual Velociraptor bones. Yeah. Just incredible. Honestly, guys, this is so cool. I, I'm gonna turn it over, uh, I just wanna remind everybody, put uh, your comments in the chat. 
your questions in the q and I, I think I'm gonna turn it over to some of our audience questions now to see what, what they're thinking about. Um, we have someone here who wants to know, uh, how, do you, how do you start as an aspiring paleo artist? Ben is curious, where would be a great place to start? Well, it's so difficult to answer. <laughs> Does it, I mean, there's there, there. It's like there's no one way. I assume everyone. It's, has like, to... it's like how do you start to win the lottery? Yes. <laughs> or, or how do you start to have to find a box with ten million dollars in it? Well, you are. I am. Uh, I. Uh, you are both classically trained art. Classically trained artists, correct? I mean, did you you went to art school, right? Yeah, so yeah. That was like the start, right? Yeah. I, yeah. Yes. What did you What did you major in? What were your concentrations? Start there, maybe. Well, you definitely have to, I mean, you definitely have to, it doesn't, you don't have to be a, a, a professionally trained artist. You can be self-taught if you want, but you definitely have to have a good knowledge of art. In my case, I did, I did go to school for graphic design and illustration. And, uh, and so that helps a lot, uh, but, uh, but uh, yeah, you do need, you do need a frame, like a, a, a base in, in, in that. And also, I would say that it helps a lot if you have a good understanding of uh, animal uh, morphology and taxonomy. That helps a lot. It can help you a lot. So you're gonna because you're gonna have to be reading a lot of technical papers. You're gonna have to be familiar with, you know, the names of bones, the names of muscles, the different types of animals. So for me, I think those are two very important things. I, I think I mentioned uh, at the beginning that um, I wasn't sure what I was going to do at first. So um, I was from a family that were naturalists. We would go out and catch reptiles and, and fish and things like that and bring them home. And um, my, both my parents were artists. So I, I always studied art. I always did art. Um, but then I took classes. I took like two scientific illustration classes in college. I also took comparative morphology with a, with, a, with a paleontologist named Carl Gantz. Actually, he was a herpetologist. And, um, and that really, really interested me. But even after that, I wasn't sure what I wanted to do with it. I, didn't already, I hadn't already put together that I, I could be a paleo artist. And then um, when I came to the museum and they were hiring, then I sort of like, I had like several clues what I should be doing, but the, the, I didn't get it until I started working in a museum and I had to do it. And then I was like, oh, right. Uh, those three things I can put together and now, now I can do something with it. But so I think Gabriel's right. It, it really helps to have some enough scientific background to know when somebody says like a zygomatic arch, exactly what that means, have a picture in your head. And, exactly. and I and also think that I have a similar experience to you, which, which I think it's a natural progression in a way. And you you sort of fall into it, into paleo art, you know what I mean? Like from, from a, you know, from being, inclined to doing scientific illustration and being interested in nature and being interested in science is one thing usually leads to the other. It did for us, but I'm not sure how. Yeah, I, I mean, it's, it's, sure. it sounds very much like, again, you know, there's, there's no right way to do it, but there are certain foundations and certain steps to take as, as just a, an initial, um, as an initial foray into this. Um, I wanna thank Barrett Klein. He shared an article in the chat uh, and also followed up with a question, have you ever found yourself debating with a scientist who may not have as an informed eye as you have when working on a depiction? Barrett used to work at this desk. He was, he was the guy I met when I'm I came I'm sorry, here. what desk? <laughs> <laughs> this very desk right here. You're Barrett, at AMNH um, though. You, I, you yeah. are at the, the American Museum of Natural History, perhaps arguably the world's most famous museum of natural history, but the Bruce is coming for you. We're doubling in size. Uh, we're, we're, we are coming for you, but we, yeah. don't, we don't stand a chance, but you, but we also are like, we also are like brother sister museums because um, we have collaborated on things many times and we share people who did their PhDs here are curators there now. And, and that is correct. We're, we're sister, we're sister institutions. So, but no, Barrett, so so, when I so came to interview the, here, Barrett said hello to me and What's me the debate with scientists then? Do we get into debates with these scientists and say, you know what, you know, do they ever come back to you and say, this doesn't look like what 
I wrote about or vice versa? Do you say, you know, you've got this thing, but, but, but we just read something else over here that, that sounds like it might be something else. Is there ever a debate like that? I mean, if, if, if you're working for a, a paleontologist who, is, you know, who has an idea, you're usually not going to tell them, you know, no, we're not doing that. We got to go in a different direction. But there have been a couple times where, uh, and it's rare. So what I'm saying is usually the important thing is to follow their instructions and to give them and to, to, to pick the ideas that they have. That's the most important thing. There have just been a couple times where I've said, like, I got some feedback that like, uh, specifically one time I was doing a ceratopsid and it was um, protoceratops, which is a pretty small one. And the, 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 the paleontologist said, you know, I think the foot should be more like an elephant foot. It should be like a cylinder with oh. just little nails drawn on the end. Okay, <laughs> So he knows what I'm talking about. But, and, and I said, and you know, so I went back, I got some papers and I got some photographs of like elephant feet versus hyrax feet. Okay, so elephants and hyraxes are extant mammals that are closely related, but they have extremely different weights. A hyrax probably only weighs four pounds or something. And an elephant weighs several tons, you know? So I, I just tried to, say, you know, are you sure that, that it wouldn't have a, a more slender foot because the mass is so much less? And, um, and you know, he kind of went away and he came back and he, and he was like, you're probably right, keep going and, and let's, see, let's see where it goes and I'll, I'll dial you back in, but, but keep going the way you were going. And so it, sometimes it's just like, you know, a little reminder, like that was one case, which is very unusual where I had actually thought about what it would look like which the curator doesn't always have to think about every detail of how, what it looks like. They have to think about, you know, every bone that makes up the nasal, the whole border of the nasal. They have to know that, every detail about that, but they don't necessarily have to think about the proportions of everything when it was alive. So it's usually the other way around. It's usually listen to the curator. Well, for me, I think that uh, I, I, yeah, I agree that there are a few occasions in which that happened, but I, so, the difference for me is that I noticed that there are there are you can go into paleontology from two backgrounds. You can go from paleontology from a geology background, and you can go from paleontology from a biology background. The people that come from a geology background usually have not a very good idea of what animals looked, you know, when they were alive. Nor they they plus they don't tend to be that interested. They tend to be more interested about the 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 shape the bone as a rock. So um, I have been fortunate, very fortunate in, in which most of the people, I think almost all the people that I've worked with have been from, have come paleontologists from a biology background because I have gotten into situations where I've said, no, we cannot do this. This makes no sense. And I'm not going to do that because you know, and then you, I don't, I wouldn't call it a debate, but I would say that, you know, you talk to the person and you start explaining to them why probably this is not the right way to go. Um, uh, but like I said, most of, almost everybody I've worked with have come from a biology background. So we can kind of can have the same uh, frame of mind into understanding, you know, that animals are more than fossilized, mineralized bones. That's an interesting distinction. I hadn't thought of that. The geologists might have a slightly different sort of intellectual culture. The, yeah. the basic thing is that what's important in the science is empiricism and rigorously provable evidence. And what Gabriel and I might be more interested, I mean, the reason you come to us might be more like, that just doesn't look right the way it's holding its head. Like if, if you've watched a lot of videos of like seriamas and weird birds running around or whatever, you, you, might, you might get an eye for what makes an animal look alive, what makes it look convincing, and what makes it um, sell, sell it to the audience sort of thing. And that's sort of the opposite of, of, of empirical evidence that you can put in a paper. You can't yeah. say, you can't say this, this animal held its head in a funny way. I mean, you, you can say it had a strange angle, but you can't say it just looked funny. That's, that's not empirical. Yeah. And then there are some th there are some hypotheses that when you put them into paper, they sound good and, and as a hypothesis. But when you put it into paper, they just look odd. And I, that recently happened to me. Um, I, I was commissioned to do some illustrations for a book, 
that I cannot really talk about much, but but one of the things that had to reconstruct had the author, who is super knowledgeable and I and I you know I get along with him super amazing. He told me, no, you have to do it this way because I want to show it this way. And I was like, okay, I did it, and I showed it to him the, the sketches, and I said, listen, this animal cannot do this. It just proportionally doesn't work. Like I've been trying to put it in every way position, it just looks odd. And then he was like, oh yeah, I hadn't thought about that because I hadn't seen it. Like sometimes seeing some something makes you realize that, you know, is what like Jason was saying before with Microraptor, um, which by the way, the example that I was doing right now was also Microraptor. Um, uh, sometimes showing the paleontologist something in graphically can let them see like, oh, maybe this doesn't work or it doesn't, you know, it cannot, it, it, something is happening. We have to keep looking at it, at this, to try to, you know, find additional data and try to see other models that could work. Microraptor is such a head scratcher. I like yes. Xu Xing, who, who, who described Microraptor for the first time. He, he was able, he, he was um, on our staff here at the museum for a while. And I got to work with him on a couple of shows pretty closely. And we were all just scratching our heads. Like he, he's, you know, it came up that I was gonna do a reconstruction of Microraptor and he had published a reconstruction of how, because the issue is that Microraptor had flight feathers on its legs as well as its arms. So in other words, it had four wings. It seemed to have four wings or maybe it just had flight feathers on its legs that didn't use for flight. But so we tried three, like three or four different configurations and they all were really weird for different reasons. Exactly. And there, there was one time where I remember Shu just went like, I don't know, try, try something, you know, do, go back and see if you can come up with another version. And I, I did, I spent a little while and, and did another sketch. And I think that's the one we ended up putting in the show, but it, everything we did was just puzzling. It, Plus, it, it has very long legs, but it's thought to be arboreal, but it doesn't really work as an arboreal animal because the legs are in the way and dinosaurs cannot, like dinosaurs, like birds cannot really splay their legs. So their legs have to be under the body. So it just looks odd trying to climb a tree. And it's just a mess. It's, it's, a, it's the, that type of dinosaur is, it's a little bit difficult because of that. That's exactly it, yeah. Uh, so we have a question here about, is there room for more abstraction in paleo art? We talk very much about how much scientific accuracy is, is important, but Charles is curious, is there room for abstraction? Yes, and there are many artists that are doing amazing abstract or more uh, simplified work. Um, I have a lot of friends that are doing, you know, there, I, I am a firm believer that there is room for every kind of artist in paleo art. You can show, and there is there are media to show that kind of work. Um, uh, there are people that are doing cartoony styles. There are people that are doing very stylized, minimal reconstructions, and they, they are amazing. What happens is that usually when you want to convey the, um, the general public with a scientific illustration, what the animal looked like, you it's easier to convey that by showing an animal that you know looks more real. But of course, there's room for more stylized uh, reconstructions in other media. There is this um, very good uh, series on YouTube called Dinosauria. It's Dinosauria, I'm, I'm blanking out. It's, the, it's, it's an animated show that um, if somebody knows in the chat can help me out because I am forgetting what the name of the show is, but it's very good and, and it's very stylized. Like the, 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 the animation is very stylized, but it works, but it's, it's very, um, very realistic in a way, but it's very stylized in the other way. And it looks great. And there's room for, for all those things. Uh, there's artistic room for a lot of things. With dinosaurs, that's a good thing with dinosaurs, that they, they transcend uh, regular science in many ways because they go to the general audience in many, wrapped in many different uh, disguises, you know? Um, yeah. And I want, go ahead. I, when, when I used to uh, mostly depict human form, I was not, I didn't, I wasn't a fan of, of tightness. I, I preferred a looser, more gestural way of working where you can sort of um, capture the way 
someone stands or 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 even some motions they make with with this this thing that we in art that we call gesture. And for me, that's really crucial to making a, a model or a, or an illustration look alive. But once I start working on Photoshop, unfortunately, it, it's hard to hard to be loose. Like you you kind of have to account for every little every little pixel on there has to be part of something real or I don't know, maybe I'll someday I'll find a way of doing it a little looser that works, but I haven't I haven't been able to do it yet. But but like a, you could take a sculptor like Rodin who 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 isn't um, like doesn't do every eyelash, but who is great at capturing the gestures of, of bodies of like different poses and and sort of expressions. How do you choose? Ruth here would like to know how you choose which pose you depict the animal in. How how do you decide? how it's going to display? Well, in my case, I, I, I think about what the hypothesized behavior is. Like, what was it doing? I, that's one thing that I want to say. I am a big uh, uh, defender of showing dinosaurs in particular as living animals, not as movie monsters, not as, you know, psychopathic I, creatures that I would always scream. <laughs> The old claymation movies where they right. well, or how they are shown in movies like, or how they are shown in movies like Jurassic Park. Or every time you see an extinct animal, it's always have to be depicted with the mouth open in an aggressive attitude. Uh, yeah, I'm a, I am a greedy against that, so you won't see that in my art. Usually, you would see them doing stuff that are completely natural, sleeping. If they're hunting, they're hunting in a normal way, not not having psychopathic eyes with the mouth open screaming all over um so yeah I, i'm a i'm a big proponent of that yeah me too wait what was uh, can you repeat the question though um how you choose what pose oh, they're in the pose well sometimes you want to get a composition that's good like okay i guess this is the best way to say it sometimes there's like the fossil finds and the papers on them are so good now that sometimes there's specific behaviors that you want to depict in your image. So like there's been a lot of stuff with uh, uh, brooding, with dinosaurs raising, you know, sitting on their eggs or, or building nests for their eggs or brooding their young or what behaviors they probably had uh, in, in, in care for their neonates, for the, for the hatchlings. Um, and so sometimes you have to depict that as clearly as possible. And in those cases, usually my compositions have been pretty bad. But other times you just want a composition, in other words, a shape, sort of a flat shape on the on the picture plane that looks really cool. So if you can, so in my case, I do a ton of sketches and I look at, uh, I might look at a ton of photographs of birds from different angles and try to figure out if I can, if there's one that um, just like grabs me or is really striking or that I think will make a great picture. And if I can fit the, the, the known poses of the animal, anatomically possible poses of the animal into that shape, then I, it's, like a, it's like a sign that I should do it. Um, I, I can show you um, really quick. Yeah. Um, uh, the, like the roughest sketches that I do, like I show you an example of this, of what uh, Jason was talking about. Uh, let me share my screen one bit and let me put this there for a minute, give me one second. Uh, um, so, just lower the size because I copied it from another one. So I usually do like a bunch of sketches like this, like rough, this is for composition purposes. Like when I'm thinking about compose, I'm having ideas for compositions. Then I, I, I make sure that I do like little thumbnails like this, um, where I think about the general composition and also a little bit of the shading that I'm going to use, like you know the values. So I, I do it all in black and white to, to to make sure that I'm thinking about values and not color first, just so I I, I can tell how what what's going to look good or or not in the composition. This is usually the first step that I take when I when I'm creating um, any work. So it's more or less what Jason says that he does as well. So I, I want to give a <laughs> I want to give a shout out to our friend Pat in the audience. Pat, I see you. I see you. Um, Pat has a couple of questions. I have a feeling Pat's a pretty big Jurassic Park fan, and we talked about that a little bit. But he has a question about uh, if you've ever heard of Jack 
Horner, who, of course, if, for those of you who don't know, is a paleontologist who, uh, according to his Wikipedia page, is most famous for discovering uh, uh, that that there were dinosaurs that provided um, care for their young. Um, he also, I think, was one of the main uh, um, consultants on Jurassic Park. Are you guys familiar with that work? Are you, do you look back at that and think how much we've learned since then? Um, Patrick, I think if you have additional questions for the chat, put them in, but I think I'm getting to the crux of it that he's a huge Jurassic Park fan and wants to know, what, did that influence you in any way? Jack Horner, who is Jack Horner? I've never heard of Jack Horner in my life. John Robert <laughs> Horner. <laughs> no, no, of course, I, know. I mean. <laughs> he's, he's being facetious. <laughs> Go ahead, Jason. Oh yeah, no, Jack Corner is a giant, and he's he's great. He's amazing. He's um, dug more fossils than um, than I can probably comprehend, and he's he's come up with a lot of uh, interesting hypotheses. I think, including that Tyrannosaurus rex was uh, scavenger only, and yeah, he did. He found um, nests of hadrosaur called Myasaura, I think, mm -hmm. uh, and. This is, to me, this is a really interesting area because he presented some of the first, well, no, I guess going back to the 20s, there was evidence of dinosaur um, nests in Mongolia, but, but he, he, he presented some papers that um, argued that the evidence that he found, which is nests that were pretty close together, um, that had the remains of hatchlings and, and I think eggshell, stuff like that, and also adults nearby, all put together on a floodplain that this could be evidence of a breeding colony where like, like flamingos do today, where maybe myosaurs all went to a, a certain place and all laid their eggs in nests at the same time and got some defense, some like joint defense out of that as a, as a community. Um, later work, I think question whether we can even tell empirically whether those nests were at the same, same year that it might be able to tell uh, like with radiological evidence or whatever, if they were within a thousand years of each other, but that like a repeated flooding and, and, and weathering pattern and, and sediment being deposited, it would be it would, two nests that were together on the same day would be the same evidence as two nests that were together a thousand years apart. And there'd be no difference that we could actually tell. So it's one of those things that has, the evidence keeps coming up. And then after the papers are published, there's a lot of debate and a lot more evidence is brought to bear and the, the field becomes richer and more interesting because of it. Another scientist named Varicchio, David Varicchio, he found other evidence about Truodon, a different species. Um, he found multiple nests of clutches of eggs with, with Truodon remains sitting on top of them the way that um, birds sit on their eggs today. And then he went further looking at the osteology of those remains that they don't, they didn't have the um, erosion of the bone that female dinosaurs and other uh, dinosaurs and, and birds have when they have to lay eggs. And so he, he hypothesized that the males sat on the eggs the way that, um, that uh, primitive birds all do today, like uh, ray tights, like uh, ostriches and, and emus, the, it's the male that always sits on the eggs. Um, and there's another line of evidence, I think, for that about the ratio of how much volume of egg mass there is to the body mass of the female. If, if a female is too many, too voluminous an amount of egg, she has, she can't sit on the eggs, she'll starve to death. So she has to, as soon as she lays, she has to go off and just eat for months to get her body weight back and recover. And that also fits for not only for Truodon, but also for some oviraptorids apparently. So it's like, it's like there's the initial discoveries of egg, of dinosaur nests and eggs in the twenties. Jack Horner contributed a lot to that it keeps going. We keep finding more nests and we keep finding more, more evidence and, and the debate keeps going. Now we have a lot of nests actually and colonies and everything and even, even colonies of pterosaurs, of, of pterosaur eggs. So now we have like a lot of evidence. For, I mean, what Jason was saying earlier, uh, I think when he first started speaking, um, it's very true. We live in, an, in a time which is probably the best time to be both a paleontologist and a paleo artist because we're living truly in the golden age of discovery of dinosaurs, not only on the number of species that we are naming and describing on a yearly basis, but also on the data that we're able to know now. The new technology allows us to, dis 
to this, you know, to know a lot more of, of, of about these animals and the new discoveries about <clears throat> their, their metabolism, the way they grew, the way they behaved. You know, it's amazing what we can tell now. Um, I have another question here from Barrett, but it's it's interesting. It's one of it's one of my questions as well. Um, what's the what's the dream job for you for for either of you? Like, what's the thing that you haven't done yet? that you really want to do? Is there a dream of working on something that you haven't tackled yet? Mm, I think I will, I've been very fortunate that I've done, there was one thing that I wanted to do. I wanted to have my illustrations on National Geographic magazine. It's one, one of the things that I wanted to do and I got to do that a couple of years ago. And I was, I was so excited when I did that. Um, I, I've been fortunate to work on really big you know, projects uh, documentaries and stuff like that. The only thing that I haven't done that I would really like to do is that I would really like to do a big mural on a on a museum. That's that's something that I would really like to do because I've not done it. I've done books and everything, but I, I I've not done a mural, and I would really love to do that. Uh, I'm going to keep that in mind. I work at a little place called the Bruce Museum, and um, we're doubling in size. We have a lot more space for that sort of thing. I'm going to keep your number, friend. Uh, Jason, how about you? Jason, how about you? I don't know. That's a good question. I mean, I did get my dream job um, for 23 years. I've been I've been doing this profession, so uh, that that's good enough. And sometimes I've, it's been the most rewarding to do projects I didn't think I would enjoy. Like I did one project that was more research than art, but it was it was about like the voyages of Captain Cook and I would read their their logs and it blew my mind. I, I I was so interested in how they would like go ashore and they would identify edible plants and they would start eating them and they would keep getting poisoned over and over again. And they got to the point where they were just like paralyzed today, you know, in the log, can't move legs. And a couple days later they're like feeling feeling halfway right, you know? And it would be like, you know, they just got to where that was no big deal. No, but for some reason, I've always I've always wanted to do a Eurypterid, which is like a sea scorpion. Uh, these giant sea scorpions that could have been like, I think the biggest ones are like eight feet long. Yeah. Never had an opportunity to do one. I would like to do one there. I think one is the state fossil of my home state of New York. So maybe someday I'll get to do that. But uh, it's, it won't be that much better than, than other things I've been able to do. Like, like I did an orchid mantis, these praying mantises that look like, uh, that are pink and they look like a flower. I got to make one of those that was the size of like a cocker spaniel. Oh, that was awesome. great. You know, that was just absolutely great. So cool. Um, Gabriel, I have a question here. People want to hear about prehistoric planet. I'm yeah. not sure you're allowed to say or not. So I'm just going to leave it to you. What can you tell us about it and your work on it? I, I have signed 300 million NDAs. And I cannot, I cannot say anything much more than what I've already said. If you follow me on social media, you know what I've said. But um, I, it's an amazing, um, it's an amazing docu series uh, with a lot of super talented people behind, uh, behind it. Uh, it has, it's been um, the the main paleontologist behind it is Darren Nash, which is a very, uh, very well-known paleontologist, and he's super knowledgeable and a very good friend of mine. And then there are a ton of uh, people that got consulted also for the for every single detail that you will see in the in the series, down to the insects that appear, down to the plants that appear. And um, and I was fortunate and lucky to be asked to be to be one of the artists. Um, involved in it, uh, you will have to wait a little bit to see my stuff, but um, but I'm I'm super happy. I, I couldn't be. It's one of the projects that I'm the most proud to be part of, just because of how important I think it's going to be. Because I I don't think we haven't seen anything this big, this monumental since uh, Walking with Dinosaurs, and I think it's gonna change a lot of perspectives of how people view dinosaurs. So 
Yeah, I think, it, and he has had a, a great reception so far already. I mean, I think the trailer, the last time I saw the trailer had like some crazy stuff, like more than 5 million views and stuff like that. So it, people are definitely excited. So it's on Apple Plus. It's on Apple Plus on December, oh, no, December, May, May 23rd to the 27th. It's a five nine uh, series. Every day is going to be a new episode. And yeah, like it so we get if so there's a second season. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think that's going to be a problem for you. Yeah. Uh, I think everybody's pretty excited about it. Um, I guess, uh, you know, it looks like we've answered all the questions. I guess we're ready to wrap up. The one last thing I want to know from you guys is where can we find you? Where can we follow what it is that you're working on now? Um, well, so I'm on, I'm on all the social medias, except, except TikTok, I don't do that. But <laughs> I, I just don't know how to translate my art into TikTok. But um, I am on, on Instagram and on Twitter as at Serpent Illus, that's serpent like serpent, but without the T, and Illus like illustration, without the T also. Um, and I'm also on Facebook, but I hardly go there. So yeah, you can find me there. And my Great. website is gabrielugeto.com. Perfect. Jason, where can we find you? You can, I'm on all the social media also, except for TikTok. And I think Gabriel is young enough that he could still be on TikTok if he, if he, just, if he just pushed it a little harder. I can't, I'm too old, I'm, by, I, I'm not, I can't get under the gate to get into TikTok. But anyway, um, I'm on all the social media other than that, uh, under my name, you can find me and I have a website, jasonbrome.com and it's also, it, it's the same URL as softdinosaurs.net. Awesome, incredible. Well, thank everybody so much for joining us tonight. Jason, Gabriel, thank you both so much. This has been so much fun. Uh, we can be found at brucemuseum.org. Uh, I've mentioned a couple times that we're uh, finishing up a capital campaign. We intend on opening the new museum in March of 2023. So get ready, it's coming. Um, for, for those of you who are interested in following Bruce Presents, our series, it's happening every month. Next month, we're gonna be doing um, an investigation on where we are with the Gardner Museum heist 30 years later. What have we learned? What's next? So go to brucemuseum.org, go to our calendar and you can sign up for that. Uh, in the meantime, we will see you guys soon. Thanks to Berkeley One, our sponsor. Without you, that wouldn't be possible. And we'll see you guys soon. Thank you guys so much. Have a great night. Thank you for coming. Thank you so much.